الحمد للہ الدی یسر علی عباد حصب الخیرات و صحر رحم طریق الجنات و شد اللہ الہ الا اللہ و دولہ شریق الہ و شد ان سیدنا و نبی محمد عبد اللہ و رسول فمحم صلی وسلم مبارک علی سیدنا و نبی محمد و علی علیہ و صحب اجمعین و علی من تبع بسن اللہ یوم الدین السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ In today's session, we will be covering Ayah 239 to 245 of Surah Al-Baqarah, inshaAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ فَرِجَالًا وَرُقْبَانًا فَإِذَا آمِنْتُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَمَا عَلَّمَكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعَلَمُونَ The meaning of this verse is that, but if you fear, then make your prayers on foot or riding. But when you are safe, then remember Allah as He has taught you all that you used to not know. In the previous ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us how we needed to keep God over all our prayers and how we need to be especially careful about Salatul Asr. Allah also reminded us how we need to make all of our prayers khanitin. This means that uh, with complete obedience and full humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our entire selves focused on Allah. So the Salah must be always um, guarded closely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah, but if you fear, then make your prayers on foot or riding. You see, you may think that only time in which we may have a genuine excuse for purposely not making one of our prayers is when you feel that you are in real danger, when you feel that there is an enemy or army that is about to attack you, or you feel there is a predator that is stalking you, or a hurricane or a sandstorm or a snowstorm is about to strike you. During such a time, you may feel that if you should occupy yourself uh, with Allah, if you should take those 10 minutes uh, to devote your entire body to Him for um, your Salah, then this danger may overcome you and you may lose your life. You know that Salah is so important and so you may think that such a time is the only time where you may have an excuse for missing it. But look at what Allah says in this ayah. Allah says that even in such a state of fear, you must still make your salah. Even when you are in such danger, you do not have an excuse for missing your salah. Allah says in this ayah that you can make your salah on foot or riding. This means you do not need to face the qibla. And you do not even need to make a full prostration or a full bowing. These scholars say it is enough to recite the words and nod your head for the movements. So we see that even in the time of fear, Allah has not given us an excuse to miss our salah. Even in a time of great fear, the salah must still be made. In the second part of this ayah, uh, when you... Uh, find yourself in a, uh, Allah says that when you find yourself in a safe place and free from the danger, then you should make your salah as usual. Notice how Allah describes the salah as something that has He taught you. This part of the ayah is then a further evidence that all of the sunnah of Rasulullah is from Allah. Because we know that the actual method in which salah is to be performed is not to be found in the Quran, but rather it is the sunnah of the Prophet so even though the Prophet wasallam taught the Muslims how to make our prayers, how to pray to Allah, we see from this part of the ayah that it was Allah who taught the Prophet wasallam, and so it was really Allah who taught us as well. In the final part of this ayah, Allah says, He has taught you all that you used to not know. This part of the ayah is general and it uh, does not apply only to the Salah. Um, rather, it applies to everything in uh, in this deen that Allah has taught us. So it includes um, the Salah and all of the other rulings of Islam that Allah has taught us. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يَتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْ كُمْ يَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجَهُمْ وَسِيَّةً لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ مَتَعَانِ إِلَى الْحَوْلِ غَيْرَ إِخَرَاجِ فَإِنْ خَرَجْنَا فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا فَعَلْنَا فِي أَنفُسِهِنَّ مِنْ مَعْرُوفٍ اللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حكيم. The meaning of this verse is that and the ones who die from you and leave behind wives should be quest for their wives a year's per, um, provision and, ready, and residence without turning them out. But if they leave of their own accord, then there is no sin on you for what they do with themselves with ma'roof. 
and Allah is mighty um, wise. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those Muslims' husbands who pass away should make sure that they leave behind for their wives provisions and residence for at least one year. It is an obligation for all uh, um, the Muslim husbands to leave behind for their wives enough money and residence for at least one year. Allah also commands in this ayah that the widows are not to be turned out from their homes. This shows that the widow has a right to stay in her husband's home for at least one year. If anyone were to try and evict her from her home, they would then be committing a great sin in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next part of the ayah, Allah says, but if they leave of their own accord, of their own will, there is no sin on you for what they do with themselves with ma'roof. You see, we learned from the previous ayahs that the idda or mourning period of a widow is four months and ten days. This is the period in which she is not allowed to marry and she is not allowed to accept direct proposals for marriage. However, in this ayah, Allah says that once the idda of a widow expires, then she is free to leave the house of her, of her deceased husband and get married if she wants to. She can do whatever she wants with herself as long as it is with maruf, meaning as long as it is in conformity with the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the obligation of the um, husband is to make sure that she has provisions and uh, residence for at least one year. But if she wants to leave, she could leave and find another husband on her own once her in that ends. Allah has left it to her description. Uh, discretion. <coughs> Uh, so she can do whatever she pleases. In the final part of this ayah, Allah says, And Allah is mighty wise. This is to remind us once again, none of the source of this uh, deen has come from, any, uh, from anywhere else. It could have only revealed uh, from Allah. Only the one who is mighty in that he can reveal any ruling that he wants could have revealed this thing. Some men at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu um, uh, may have questioned as to why Allah revealed a deen that has given so many allowances to women. Allah reminds such doubters that He is the Mighty, so He has uh, He does as He pleases. When Allah legislates a law, there can be none to question it. Allah is Mighty, and so there is no force that can overcome Him, no one to oppose Him or His legislation. Thus, you cannot resist the law of Allah. Even if it is in not your liking, you must still submit to it. This is because this law comes from the mighty and so there is no resisting it. These laws also come from the one who is the most wise, the one who has all the wisdom and the one who knows what is in the best interest of all human beings, both men and women. So even if we cannot immediately see the wisdom in the law of Allah, we must still submit to them because we know that they come from the one who is most wise. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِلْمُطَلَّقَاتِ مَتَاءٌ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ حَقًّا عَلَى الْمُتَّقِينَ The meaning of this verse is that, and for the divorced women, a provision with ma'roof, a duty on the muttaqoon. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislates um, that all women who are divorced should be given a provision by their former husbands. This provision depends on the circumstances of the divorce. As we have mentioned, uh, this provision is to be a generous gift if the marriage was not consummated and the mahar was not paid, or it is to be at least half of the mahar if the, if the marriage was not consummated but the mahar was paid, or it is to be the full mahar if the marriage was consummated. In all three of these cases, the divorced women receive a generous provision to make sure that they are well taken care of. So once again, we see the mercy and love that Allah has for all the sisters in this ummah, all the women in this ummah. Regardless of their situation, Allah has provided them with something. Allah also uh, says that such a provision is a duty on the muttaqoon. Um, this shows that such a provision uh, for divorced women is an obligation on all Muslim husbands. If they fail to give their wives uh, this provision, they will be sinning in front of Allah and He will question them on the last day. 
In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ the meaning of this verse is that uh, that is how Allah makes clear to you His signs so that you may reflect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes this section of the surah with this statement. In this section, we have seen Allah gave us many rulings concerning prayers, marriage, divorce, family life, laws of inheritance, and mourning period uh, for women. Right? Can anyone come and say that these rulings are in any way unclear were then in any way difficult to understand after reading these ayahs can we say that we do not know what they mean should we think that these rulings are difficult or impossible to implement or follow in our lives of course not because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah that is how Allah makes clear to you his signs these rulings and laws in the Quran are the signs of Allah and He has made it perfectly clear for us. If we follow them, then we will attain the pleasure of Allah and we would be fulfilling the purpose of our existence. If we fail to um, uh, follow them, we will be earning the um, displeasure of Allah and we would be turning away from the purpose of our creation. It is as simple as that. Allah tells us uh, in this ayah that he made his signs clear for us so that we may reflect on them. There are uh, two aspects of this reflection. One is that we reflect on them in order to understand them, to learn how to correctly implement them in our lives. This is what the scholars of fiqh do. Another aspect of this reflection, however, is that we um, think about these laws and we realize how perfectly they are and so we realize how they could ha only have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the next verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ تَرَى إِلَى الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَهُمْ أُلُوفٌ حَضْرَ الْمَوْتِ فَقَالَ لَهُمُ اللَّهُ مُوتُوا ثُمَّ أَهْيَاهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ The meaning of this verse is that um, have you not looked uh, to those who went forth from their homes fearing death and they were in the thousands? So Allah said to them, die, then he gave them life. Surely Allah is uh, full of bounty to mankind, but most of mankind do not give thanks. With this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a new section of this beautiful surah. We see that Allah bringing our attention and the attention of the early Muslims uh, to a group of people who tried to flee from death. Notice how Allah describes this group of people as being in the thousands and yet they still feared death. This means, uh, this reminds us once again um, how death is a constant in the universe of Allah. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how many uh, other people you may have with you, no matter how hard you may try, you can never overcome death. So these were a group of people who fled from their homes in the thousands because of fear of death. We are not going to speculate on who these people were for us to take um, the lesson from this ayah. Um, it is not important for us to know who these people were and even where, why they fled from their homes fearing death. They could have been um, fleeing from an enemy or from a disease or from some natural disaster. We don't know. Allah knows best. However, what we are going to try to take uh, uh, the lessons from what happened to them. That's what we are going to do. In the next part of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So Allah said to them, die. Then he gave them life. Notice once again here the beauty of the Quran. Allah tells the entire story of these people in only a few words. Look at the depth of uh, meaning that these words carry. It only a few words. Allah relates everything that happened to them. Allah tells uh, us about these people that even though they left their homes because of death, Allah just told them to die and they died. Once again, we do not need to speculate on whether or not Allah spoke with such people or the manner of that speech. We simply take the lesson that they died when Allah decreed um, for them that they should die. This shows that even though they tried to escape death, they could not do it. They even left their homes 
to try and escape death, but they could not escape the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah told them to die, and they died. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought them back to life. This shows us how both life and death are under the complete control of Allah. Allah gives life to whom He pleases, and He takes death uh, from whom He pleases, or He gives death to whom He pleases. As we can see from this ayah, Allah can even resurrect a people back to life after they have died. Allah can destroy an entire nation and then bring them back to life only by His will. Such is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the final part of this ayah, Allah says, Surely Allah is full of bounty to mankind, but most of mankind do not give thanks. Here, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us how He is full of bounty to mankind. Even life and death are from uh, His bounty. As Allah has told us in other ayahs of the Quran, He created both death and life in order to test us, right? This test is uh, indeed the greatest of bounties for mankind. It is a chance for us to prove ourselves to Allah, to show Him that we are indeed worthy of His love and mercy. However, as Allah also tells us in this ayah, most of mankind do not give thanks for this gift that He has given. To give thanks for this gift is to believe in this message that Allah has sent and then to strive to our utmost to worship and serve Allah as this message commands us to do. If we fail to do that, then we are being great, ungrateful to Allah for, his, uh, for, this grace, for this great bounty that He has given us. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ the meaning of this verse is that and fight in the way of Allah and know that surely Allah is hearing, knowing. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the early Muslims community uh, a clear order to fight in his cause. We know that for over 13 for over 13 years of da'wah in Mecca, fighting was not allowed. Now that the Islamic State was established, Allah has given uh, the command uh, for the early Muslims community to fight. As we mentioned earlier, that there are only two reasons when fighting is permissible in Islam. The first is to remove the obstacle in the way of da'wah. And the second reason is to defend the lives of Muslims who are oppressed. In the next part of the ayah, Allah gives another command. And when he says, know that surely Allah is hearing knowing. Here Allah commands the early Muslims to know with certainty that he hears and knows everything. This is a fact about which certain knowledge without any doubts must be established because it is a certain knowledge that leads to action. When the Muslims know for certain that Allah hears the call that is sounded to fight in his way and they know for certain that Allah knows those who respond to this call and those who sit back then they will think twice about not heeding this call. When the Muslims know for certain that Allah hears and knows everything, then they will be motivated to strive to seek His pleasure. Allah knows the reason why those who held back did not go forward. He knows whether their excuse was valid or not. Allah knows what is in their hearts and He hears the words that they spoke to themselves as they decided whether to uh, go or not to go forward in the way of Allah. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يُقْرِضُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا فَيُضَاعِفَهُ لَهُ أَضْعَافًا كَثِيرًا وَاللَّهُ يَقْبِضُ وَيَفْسِطُ وَلَهِ تُرْجَعُونَ The meaning of this verse is that um, who is the one who will lend to Allah goodly loan so that he may double it for him many times over and it is Allah who withholds and grants abundance and to him shall you return. Allah begins this ayah um, by asking a question. Uh, who is the one who will lend to Allah a goodly loan? Allah is calling out to all Muslims and he is asking for a volunteer. Allah is asking them who can lend to him a goodly loan. Now some may ask why Allah would need a loan when he is the one free of all needs. 
the answer to this question is that this loan is a part of the test that Allah has given us. When you give your wealth to Allah, you are demonstrating your love for Him, your submission for Him, and your willingness to sacrifice for Him. So in this ayah, Allah is encouraging the Muslims to spend their wealth in this way as part of the test that He has given them. They are called on to spend to support the da'wah, to spend to build the armies to spread the message of Allah and to spend to establish the deen of Allah. This wealth that they give, spend, um, this wealth that they spend is a goodly loan that they will give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maududi um, tells us in his tafsir of this ayah that when Allah describes the loan as a goodly loan, it means that it must be a loan that is given purely for the pleasure of Allah. You must sacrifice your wealth your time and your efforts seeking only Allah with them and nothing else. If your intentions are tainted with some uh, ostentation or some arrogance or some desire of praise from the people of this world, then such a loan will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that what matters at the end of the day is that you strive your best to worship and serve Allah. When you meet Allah on the last day, he will question you on whether or not you spend as many moments of your life remembering him and striving to worship and serve him by doing the actions that are pleasing to him. So you must be sincere to Allah in what you do and you must make Allah as the goal of all your actions. So when you spend, it must only be for Allah and no, and no one else. Other scholars add that what Allah means by a goodly loan is a loan the source of which is pure and lawful. Allah does not want for you to spend for him from that which is acquired through unlawful means. So then obviously any money that is earned through interest or theft will not be, uh, will have no reward with Allah, no matter with how much sincerity it may have been given. Similarly, if you spend your time in da'wah, but you ignore the time that must be spent looking after your family or taking care of your obligations, then this is the time that is not accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. It is time that should have gone for your family and not for the da'wah. This is because it is an obligation for you to look after your family and to take care of their needs, just as it is an obligation to work in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, do not ever feel that you do not have enough time to do all of this. If you put your trust in Allah, then you should have a hope that He will bless your time that you have and allow you to accomplish all of your needs and obligations. Remember that most of the Sahabas were not monks who dedicated all of their times for worship. Rather, they had families and responsibilities as well. However, um, despite this fact, they still found the time to address all of their obligations towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They still established the Islamic State with the Prophet wasallam, and they still defeated all of the enemies of this message. They did this despite the fact that they were humans like you and me, and they had responsibilities like you and me. So, what does Allah say about this goodly loan that the Muslim give? Allah described it as a loan that he may double it for him many times over. So whoever gives a, a, to Allah this loan, they can be certain that Allah will double it for them over and over again. You give to Allah a little bit of your wealth, or a little bit of your time, or a little bit of your effort, and Allah will double what you give him again and again. He will then return what you have given him both in this life and the hereafter. What can you expect from the one who owns everything and who can give without limit? You can expect rewards and blessings that you never thought possible. So be sure that whatever you give to Allah will be returned to you in ways that you never thought to be possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, and it is Allah who withholds and grant abundance. This is to remind the Muslims that just as Allah controls life and death, He also controls our provisions. Allah can withhold the provisions for whom He pleases and He can grant abundance for whom He pleases. Everything 
that we have is from Allah and he will increase and decrease what he gives as he pleases. So this reminds the early Muslims that just as they should not sit back from fighting in the way of Allah because of fear of death, they should also not hold back from spending their wealth in the way of Allah because of fear of poverty. It may be that they give away a large portion of their wealth and then they become richer or it may be that they hold back their wealth and then they become poor. They do not control their wealth and their provisions but rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who controls their wealth and provision. In the final part of this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and to him shall you return. We mentioned um, how the human beings uh, were a forgetful creatures. So this is to remind the Muslims once again the reason why they should spend and the reason why they should fight in the cause of Allah. You only fight and you only spend in preparation for this day when you will return to Allah. When you return to Allah, He will judge you for each and every one of your actions. How hard did you strive in the way of Allah? How much did you sacrifice from your wealth and your time for Him? How much thank did you give to Him for this great bounty of life that He has given you? This meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the goal for each and every one of us. After this meeting, our fate for all eternity will be decided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of our return to Him a good one. We begin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and life is nothing but a journey back to Him. With this we end our lesson for today. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Ashadun la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah wa tawbirak. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.